Daniel Logan. And I really love the, the, the term girl power just because I'm thinking about how powerful these women were and they didn't even know it at the time. They really didn't. They didn't understand the far reaching impacts their lives would have. Um, so how many people, I'm just curious, even know who Martha Daniel Logan was? Anybody? Okay, we have two, three. Okay, only <laughs> historical society people don't count. Okay. <laughs> All right, so fair to say not many, okay, which is one of the reasons I'm excited to talk about her. Um, I think she's kind of an unsung hero um, in, in discussions about Charleston women in history, and I'm so thrilled to be able to talk about her. I didn't know about her initially. I knew about her father, who we'll talk about, Robert Daniel, um, our island's namesake. But um, I kind of, you know, as many of us do when we're digging into history, we go down all these little rabbit holes. Everyone can relate to that, I'm sure. And I kind of discovered her by accident. So I was thrilled um, to know about her and her life. Um, so this, this phrase, her garden was her delight, is a phrase that people often say about Martha. Um, and there's a reason for that. We'll get into that in a couple minutes. But um, she had a trailblazing horticultural legacy with roots right here on Daniel Island. Pun intended. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of that. I'm sorry in advance. I'm just um, So anyway, we got to talk about this guy. Um, her her famous dad. I guess we'll start with him. Um, just a little background about him. If you don't know, um, he has a little royal lineage. Um, so he was kind of up there in social circles. Very prominent man. Um, he was born in Wales, England, in 1646, and he was a British merchant and a captain of ships that traveled between, uh, of course, England and. Bur Bermuda, Barbados, and Charlestown. Um, he was only 24 years old, just to give you a sense of how young he was when the English first settled on the Ashley River. Um, and the first recorded presence we have of him in this area is when he was granted um, some land in 1675 along the Stono River. But we don't think he actually uh, accepted that or took that. We know later he did amass uh, thousands upon thousands of acres. I think one estimate I saw was 48,000. Um, in this area, including um, Daniel Island, of course, the Georgetown area, and what is known today as Brook Green Gardens. That used to be Daniel Land. So, kind of interesting. Um, so for those of you who are curious about where his home was, you've heard us talk about this before, I think, if you are a frequent guest to our meetings, but the picture I have up there kind of shows just the foundational remains of his home. And um, there's, it's still there, it's still, that part is still, is still in existence. Um, but it's the area around it is under construction. So the waterfront development is kind of like springing up all around this. Um, we are told that it's not being built on top of it, which of course is very encouraging and exciting for us. We, we did not want that to happen. And that they're going to do something to um, honor that site with some signage and some special, special way of showcasing that. So hopefully they will hold true to that and that will happen. Um, does everybody know where that is? kind of generally, so right down on the Wando River, a really pretty site. Um, so the Daniels were really um, a first family in South Carolina, among them, um, because Daniel um, eventually would become deputy governor of uh, the northern portion of the Carolina colony, and later uh, deputy governor of the southern portion. Um, so he, he was pretty high up there in terms of social circles. Um, so they, de they did develop um, a very stately home, I would guess, along the Wando River. We have no pictures or illustrations of it, but we would assume it was pretty nice uh, for the day. Um, and he married um, his second wife in 1701. Um, that is Martha Frances Wainwright. And they would go on to have five children. Don't know what happened to the first wife. Still trying to pull on those threads. Um, <laughs> That could be a fun topic to dive into. I really don't know, but um, we do know that you know when he remarried, they they built their family together. He and Martha Francis. Um, so the big question, really, uh, to me when I was starting this, was where was young Martha born? There are a lot of sources that say she was born in Charleston, in South Carolina, but um, some historians say that's probably not true. That maybe she was born in North Carolina because her father was serving as deputy governor during the time she was born. Um, so, but I did find a record of her birth in the St. Thomas and St. Dennis uh, Parish records. You can see it there in pink, um, December 29th, 1704. But I think that that could possibly be explained uh, in that in North Carolina, they didn't have a Church of England or an Anglican church there during the time that um, Daniel was serving. So it might be possible that he just recorded her birth here, even though she was born there. So. The jury's still out, but we think we think there's a chance that she was born up there. But shortly thereafter, 
uh, came right back to Daniel Island with her family, and this picture is not their home. <laughs> I want to just point that out. This is not their home. In fact, you'll hear about this home from Leanne uh, in her next presentation. This is Medway Plantation, um, but the reason I have a picture of it is it was built in 1704, and so I'd like to think, maybe falsely, that the architecture might have been similar for the Daniel home, and of course, that reminds me of Daniel Island, just the whole scene. So um, I thought maybe that's sort of what her house might have looked like. Um, so her early life, um, she's a young girl, she's a teenager growing up on Daniel Island. Her father also had a nursery, so we think that she got some of her interests from him. Um, he liked dabbling in cultivating plants and things like that. Um, so of course between that and just her environment, it just sort of blossomed. See, there's another one, sorry. Um, so that, that all was, was going along fine, but then in 1718, when she was just 13, her father dies. Um, on his plantation, he survived, of course, by his wife, Martha, and their children. Um, and then just a year later, this is where it gets really kind of Jerry Springer-ish. Okay, I'm just going to throw that. Okay, a year later, Martha marries Colonel George Logan. And then a couple months after that, daughter Martha, who's 14, marries stepbrother George Jr. <laughs> really fun when you're trying to trace the ancestry on these four people because it's very confusing. Um, but it wouldn't have been that uncommon, I guess, in the day, of course, because um, women really didn't have, a, as, as I know Leanne will talk about probably, I know she does on her tour, women's rights were kind of non-existent during this time. Um, so it was very common for women to want to remarry quickly. Um, they were not the breadwinners. Um, they wouldn't have wanted to remain a widow, most likely. So um, the, the speed with which she remarries is not that unusual. The fact that the daughter married the stepson, that's a little weird. Okay. Uh, but anyway. Okay, so Martha and George Jr., they spend some time raising their family um, in a plantation on the Wando River. We're told it was about 10 miles from downtown Charleston, so I'm assuming it might have been Daniel Island, but there's also some speculation it could have been a little farther north, maybe in the Rivertown area, what today is known as Rivertown. They had land there as well, also on the Wando. So somewhere in this vicinity, they um, raised their family. Um, and then, like in the late 1730s, early 1740s, something changes, and we don't know what happened. I can't find any good evidence of why, but Martha starts uh, looking to raise some money for the family. Um, she opens up a boarding school at her home. This is actually an ad for a boarding school she had downtown, but initially she opens one up uh, at, her, at her home's plantation on the Wando. She's trying to earn some money. She asks her students that she can teach to read and write, and study arithmetic and um, teach embroidery and other kind of household, um, household chores. So she's trying to raise some money, um, obviously. Um, and then they eventually move downtown. They sell off their land uh, on the Wando and they move downtown and they relocate to an area then known as Trotts Point, which is of a modern map. Uh, you can see the State Ports Authority on the far right. It's kind of in that area in red, of sort of the area known as Trotts Point, present day Ansonboro area. So we don't know where her exact house was, but we know it was somewhere, somewhere in there. So she really starts to just pour herself into the gardening in the, in the 1740s and 50s, um, and she begins again to raise money. Not only is she boarding students, but she's now selling seeds, and she's you know <laughs> selling plantings and roots and all kinds of things from her garden. She's developing quite a reputation and a name for herself in the community, befriending some of the other prominent Charlestonians who have gardens, like Ms. Lamble and Alexander Garden. So she, um, she's, she's traveling in, the, or in those circles, um, but she uh, begins to think, you know, some people might want some advice, some amateurs might want some advice on this gardening stuff. It shouldn't just be limited to the wealthy folks, right? We should have some good advice for everybody. So she writes um, uh, this amazing little gardening calendar in 1752, and it's published in the South Carolina Gazette, a huge accomplishment for a woman of her day. Not only is she working and earning money, but she's publishing unheard of, right? This doesn't happen in the 1700s. Um, so very, very um, big deal for her. But here's the little caveat. Here is a copy of the calendar. If you look on the upper left, it says done by a lady. So she doesn't even get to put her name on it. So um, not great, but <laughs> she does, um, her name is added after her death later, but just during her lifetime, um, it's not on there. But we're told, just from doing research, I was told that, or learned that um, people in Charleston knew it was hers. They knew it came from her. She had that much of a, a good reputation. So it was just, these are just a couple of things that she would write about, like when to, when to, uh, what to do when the frost comes, how to, how to preserve your seeds or how to get seeds, 
just really good practical information. Um, it was kind of funny because one of her little entries says, and hey, if you don't get to it this month, there's always next month. So it's kind of like <laughs> laid back, but you know, just really good everyday kind of info. And then something else extraordinary happens in her life. Um, in the 17, early 1760s, she meets this man. John Bartram was a botanist. Um, he uh, was a botanist to the king, so a royal botanist, but he lived in Philadelphia and he would travel up and down to all the different colonies and trade seeds and plants. Like at this point, everything people planted was new, right? They were all exploring new crops, new plants. So he kind of just kept his finger on the pulse of that. He would visit all these gardens and different planters. And he came to Charleston and heard, oh, this is Martha Logan, I gotta go, I gotta go visit her because her garden is, you know, got a great reputation. So he goes to visit Martha and they begin this amazing friendship that would span many, many years. They start writing back and forth to each other um, and they just share, share roots, share clippings, share whatever they can, um, gardening advice, gardening, gardening this and that. He sends her things from England. Um, she sends him things from the Carolinas to England and to Philadelphia. It just kind of goes all over the place. Um, but uh, these are just some of this is excerpts of those letters. She'd always include a little inventory of what was in the box, <laughs> some jessamine, Italian jessamine, which I went to find over the weekend and they don't have it anymore. <laughs> but I imagine it's very similar to Carolina jasmine that's very um, prominent in Charleston today. Um, so I found this very interesting because Peter, I'm uh, sorry, John Bartram wrote a letter to his colleague Peter Collinson in England um, about Logan and he said she was an elderly widow lady, which I found interesting because she was still, her husband was still living at this point, as far as I know, um, who spares no pains or cost to oblige me. Her garden is her delight. There's the phrase um, that became somewhat famous associated with Martha. Um, and she had the fine one. He was only with her five minutes. So he can, I mean, what an impression she made <laughs> in five minutes um, with him. But as he says to his friend, they um, had a wonderful mutual correspondence that one silk bag hath passed and repassed full of seeds several times. So um, very special friendship. Um, don't know much about what happened to her in the late 60s and early 1770s, but do know that she passed away at age 74 in 1779. Um, and her remains are with those of her husband and her parents and her stepfather, Colonel George Logan, all at St. Philip's Church downtown. And um, what I think is really cool is 300 years later, she's finally getting some well-deserved recognition for her efforts. Um, she's been the subject of a few books. Um, this is one of them. I, I won't read all of that to you, but it's called Such News of the Land. And um, I just love that the author calls her a highly respected horticulturalist and credits her with writing the first gardening treatise in America and breaking gender barriers of the day. So that's pretty cool. And this is just another quote. He compared her to Eliza Lucas Pinckney and Jane Colden, um, just talking about just the impact that their work had on the field of science as, as women, as scientists, and as writers. So um, unfortunately, she didn't hear any of this during her lifetime, but, but it is nice to see that she's getting it now. Um, in March of 2020, she was named one of the top 50 groundbreaking women of science by the website stacker.com. Some other names on the list, Marie Curie, um, Jane Goodall, a, a primatologist. So she's up there with some of these really big names, which is very exciting um, that she would be included in that. Um, let's see. This was a, another book that was written about her, and I love this quote. Um, However poor or profitable her business may have been, hers was a richly rewarding life. She had a husband and children, friends and flowers, and because of her flowers, a place in any history of American gardening. Mm -hmm. And this is her actual signature, which I thought was really cool and seal. I took a picture of this South Carolina Historical Society reading room downtown. Um, that was on a legal document, a land transaction, it's her signature. And this is her daughter. Well, I don't have any pictures of Martha, but her daughter, Martha Logan Chalmers, married Dr. Lionel Chalmers, who uh, the street Chalmers Street is named for. So. Um, I wish we had more uh, paintings of the Daniel family, but we just have this one, and I think one of Robert Daniel as well. Um, and then this is the last slide I have. Just wanted to share with you that we are really working hard to honor Martha and see that she gets some, some well-deserved attention for all of her achievements. Um, we're planning a new garden for her in her name and memory. Um, it's going to be part of the Osprey Trail, um, and it's a joint project between us, the Historical Society, and the Garden Club. So um, if any of you want to get involved in that, we'd love it. Um, it's going to be fun next year. That should uh, be open. And it will feature her favorite plants, some of the ones she mentioned in her letters to John Bartram. So very exciting. So hopefully I didn't go too long. Thank you so much.